Yes, amen to that. You may be seated. Thank you so much, our worship team. They sang to us, miracles breaking through, God's, when God's love is in the room. I hope that this becomes a space whenever we come together for worship, whenever we are present with God, whenever we want to seek that time and that intimacy with God, I pray that you feel how loved you are and that this becomes a space and a place where you can put your burdens down and no longer have to carry your shame and that you know that and you feel that. In today's scripture, it comes out of Mark, the gospel, and, and this is a pivotal, pivotal point within this gospel today. You see, Jesus draws us to the attention of, do we know who he truly is? And if we do know who he is, how did we come about to that idea? And what does this mean for us in our lives today? And so let us open our ears and hear God's spirit and see how God is trying to move us into a deeper understanding of who our Savior is. Our reading today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, beginning with verse 27. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, Who do people say I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later, he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must first give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, it never ceases to amaze me at how God works in our lives and how the message that I'm bringing to you today is a, is a message that I desperately needed to hear and be reminded of. And I just love how God times things so perfectly. You know, a lot of us have different ideas of who Jesus is. And it came from different places, and, and we have different understandings. And so I thought it'd be kind of fun to see what people on the street say about who Jesus is. So let's take a look. Ooh. It's a video. It's awesome, thanks. Historical figure? I don't know. I think he was just a person. I don't know. Just a normal person, like us. He was a selfless person. I have no clue. He was a man. I think he was marketing genius because he got people to believe him. I don't, I don't think he's the son of God. I don't, don't believe that at all. If David Copperfield was in the day of Jesus, he would be Jesus. I'm pretty sure he existed. Like, I'm not going to say that he didn't exist. He was God's son, but so was Gandhi, and so was Muhammad and so is, you know, we're all God's children. Jesus is someone I pray to. Well, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. 
Um, and he, to me, is the like symbol of just ultimate forgiveness and ultimate love. He's sort of that like constant figure in my life. Jesus is also Isa in Arabic, and he was a messenger as well. He was just extremely enlightened, like religiously and morally. He was somebody that um, just tried to um, impart wisdom on others and um, make the world a better place. I think he saw something that a lot of people didn't see and still don't see in others. And I, I think that's just a lot of love and, and hope. Jesus sort of seemed like an ominous uh, figure. You know, he just, he, he was God and it was hard to relate to him. But I think as I've grown in my faith a lot, I've really started to see Jesus as my closest friend. So lots of different ideas of who people think Jesus is. Although I've never heard him likened to David Copperfield or a marketing genius, that was actually a first. You know, growing up, I heard things like, he's your savior. He's your redeemer. I heard things like, Jesus wants you to be nice to your sister. <laughs> and Jesus wants you to behave in church, right? We have all these ideas of who Jesus is. And so what is the word on the street of who Jesus really is? He asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And you know, this was really shocking to me actually because I thought, Jesus, you know who you are. You so much know who you are that you are about to step out into something that will lead to rejection and suffering and death. Why are you asking the disciples, those who are following you, what people are saying? Why do you even care? And you know, I couldn't help but think that what Jesus is doing here is he wants to see if those who are closest to him have been influenced by others. How do you, why do you think what you think about me? Is it because of what others are saying about me? Have they taken the perception of those outside and taken it upon themselves to understand better who Jesus is? And we do this all the time to people. You know, we see people, what they do what, or what they don't do, and then we come up with these assumptions of who they are. You know, sometimes we decide who they are just based off of a few encounters with them. And many times we think we know who people are just by what other people say about them. And so I actually love that Jesus asked them, who are people saying I am? And so what people are saying is John the Baptist, and, you know, th that's not too bad, actually. John the Baptist, you know, was someone who came bringing the message of God, drawing people closer into a deeper relationship with God, so they're not too far off. At this point in time, though, he's been beheaded, but they think that he's come back to life, but no, they don't quite got it. And then they think he's Elijah, which I could definitely see that, right? Once again, coming, proclaiming the kingdom of God, talking about the Messiah who's to come and seeing little glimpses of what the kingdom looks like, miracles and evil being cast out. But no, that's not it either. And then others think he's a prophet. You know, these are actually really, really high positions, high things for people to be thinking, which isn't too bad considering what others have said about Jesus. Let's not forget what the most religious people have thought about Jesus at this time, those who were closest to God, right? Jesus was a drunk. Jesus was a glutton. Jesus was that guy that hung out with those lowlifes. He was the guy that can do miraculous things, but you know what? It's probably because Satan was working through him. These are other things that people have said about who Jesus was. But what is the million dollar question here? Jesus skips right over and goes, but who do you think I am? I want us to pay attention here because Jesus does something that really had me confused. First you ask what a people, who do people say I am, right? You wanna see if their perception, you know, I, I love that tactic. Does your perception, is it based off of what others think? But Jesus doesn't even address the fact that other people, who they thought he was. 
He doesn't even touch on it. He doesn't say, oh, that's good. All right, at least they're thinking I'm a prophet now and not a drunk. Like, he doesn't say any of these things. And really, isn't that how we are to be? We are to be so secure in who we are and know who we are. And the whole reason Jesus was so secure in who he was is because of the time that he spent in God's word. He knew who he was. He knew as a child growing up with the Torah, as he read, he saw himself. And the Spirit moved him in Daniel 7 when he says, someone called the Son of Man will come and he will reign eternally. Jesus knew that was him. As he read the prophet Isaiah and the suffering servant that one would come to take upon himself the sins of all of Israel, and not just Israel, but all the world and the nations, so that nothing would ever separate us from a relationship with God, he knew in the depths of his soul that is who he was. That's why even at 12 years old, he said, Mom, you should have known I was in my father's house. Jesus knew who he was. So he didn't need to take what anyone else said. He didn't even give any time, any attention to it. And that is exactly what Jesus wants for us to, to be so secure in who we are and who God has created us to be that we don't allow outside influences to impact us. But he says, who do you think I am to his disciples? Now you in Greek is actually plural. So he's not just talking to one disciple, he's talking to them all. And let's take a look at what they say. Peter, you gotta love Peter, because Peter's the outspoken one. You know, he's a little, you know, impulsive, and he goes up, he's like, I'll talk for everyone. You're the Messiah. And you would think that Jesus would be like, ding, 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 yes. They didn't, you know, base their idea and perceptions off of what others were saying about me. They got it. But then why does Jesus go on to say, don't tell, I don't want you to tell anyone. Don't don't talk about this. And you know, it's because Jesus knows more than what we say. Jesus knows more than the facial expressions we have or what we're showing the world. Jesus knows what's in our heart and he knows what's in our minds. And he knew that even though Peter said, you are the Messiah, and he was speaking on behalf of all the disciples, he knew in in their hearts they didn't know what that really meant. You see, they were thinking of this kind of Messiah. They were thinking of a king that would come to reign, one that would overcome and conquer the Roman oppressors, one that would rebuild the temple, He would be the king of kings, just like King David coming from that line. God would bless him abundantly. This is the idea that they had of who he was. And let's keep it real. That might have fed into a little bit of why they left it all behind and were following him. If this guy's the Messiah, who is going to make it big one day? You know, my cousin, he's getting scouted right now by the NFL, and I always tell him, "Don't don't forget me. Don't forget who I am. I have friends that play the lotto. I'm like, remember me when, if you win. Right? They're following him, but they have this idea that one day, one day we're going to hit it big, right? And we'll be next to the one who has power. You know, James and John, this is why their mom advocated for them. Jesus, can my son sit at your right and your left when you're reigning in your glory? This is the idea that they had of what the king and the Messiah was to look like. But really, Jesus had a whole different idea. Jesus' understanding of what the Messiah would look like would be someone who was rejected, someone who suffered on behalf of others unjustly, even though he did nothing wrong, someone who was willing to not live for themselves and what their wants and desires was, but to step outside of themselves and sacrifice themselves for a love that is so deep, it is even for those that had never known him. You know, this part of the scripture alerts us to something big. You see, Peter and the disciples, they, were, they traveled with him. They were so close to Jesus. They experienced Jesus in a way that we don't, right? 
And yet, and yet they may have had the right title for who Jesus was, but they had the wrong understanding. And so this is a part in the scripture where I really feel God's spirit telling me that sometimes we need to take a step back and we need to look and we need to evaluate how do we really know who Jesus is? Does it come through the lens in which we grew up? You know, I remember hearing Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Turn the other cheek. You know, don't get upset at people. That, what would Jesus do? And so what that created was it created a bunch of people that didn't know how to argue well or disagree well. And it created people that actually are conflict avoidant, which isn't good either, and definitely not what Jesus modeled. Do we know Jesus as the one who supports all our human desires and wants? So often we think that, you know, I really, really want this. If you are a young girl who ever went to parochial school, there is one point in time when I know you prayed to Jesus for that boy to like you. I know you did. I did. Oh, Jesus, please, please, Tony, he's, let him like me back. You know, Jesus doesn't give us what we want. And later on, Tony became someone that cheated on every wife he had, and he ended up having three. You know, Jesus doesn't give us what we want or desire. Jesus gives us what we need. What we need in our lives that will guide us on a journey so that we look more like Christ and more like ourselves. Jesus is the one who sustains the values that I want to enhance, that we want to enhance. I cannot tell you how many family members think that Jesus is aligned with their political party. <laughs> Literally. Jesus is aligned with one political party. It is the kingdom of God. And if you look at the values that the kingdom of God holds, I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't matter what human political party you are standing with. They're, they don't match often. Are we looking at Jesus and do we know him as the one who will enable us to become whatever we want? Absolutely not. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what I wanted. I had this idea, I'm good at sales. I was like, all right, I'm gonna go to college for business. I'm gonna make a lot of money. I'm gonna hopefully get a really big expense account. And then I just get to have fun with all my clients and travel. Like, that was what I wanted. And wow, Jesus took me on a journey. Nine years of higher education. My expense account doesn't look anything like I imagined. But Jesus gave me what I needed. Jesus guided me down a path for a vocation and a calling that would fill my soul and would bring me true happiness and joy. And Jesus knew that those other things I thought I wanted would never do that. I love how Jesus wants them to so desperately understand what this means to truly follow him that He's just, he's, he's talking to them openly at this point. There's no more parables, no more cryptic language. I'm just going to lay it out. He goes on to say, all right, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. This is paraphrased, but three days later, you know, I'm going to die. But three days later, I will, I will rise again. He lays it out. So there is absolutely no confusion of what this looks like. And then he goes on to tell them, that if you want to follow me, if you really want to follow me, you can't be looking through the lens of what you had before. You can't be thinking that there will one day, ooh, if I give my life to Jesus, one day I'm going to be sitting next to him on that throne. One day I'm going to be sitting there in the lap of luxury, all this good stuff. It'll be good stuff, but it'll be good stuff that you never imagined. But if we want to truly follow Jesus, we need to be willing to die to all those other things and our ideas of what we think it, life is supposed to look like and how life is supposed to be. And we need to truly go on this adventure with Jesus. And you know what? When you push against the ways of the world, it will push back at you. 
And you too may experience rejection. And you too may suffer. When I started walking down this path to become a pastor, I lost friends, I lost family members. It is not an easy road. And Jesus wanted to them to know exactly what it meant to follow him. Once again, Peter, I love him, super impulsive, right? He's like, all right, Jesus, I'm going to speak on behalf of everyone. Come here, come here. He takes him to the side, and he's like, let me help you help yourself. This is not good for your campaign, all right? There's only 12 of us who are sold out following you. And there were some women, too. But, you know, like, you're going to lose some, right? Telling them, hey, you're going to be rejected and suffer, and you have to be willing to even die for this way. So he goes and he tells them that. And, and how does Jesus reply? Get behind me, Satan. I was reading this over with my daughter, and she was like, you know what, that just feels like it's a little extra. <laughs> She's like, Jesus didn't have to go there. She didn't need, you know, Jesus didn't need to call Peter Satan. That's a little much. And I said, well, why not? He's not talking to Peter. And she said, well, what do you mean? And I said, Jesus knows Peter. Jesus knows the heart of Peter. That voice is not the voice of Peter. Jesus knows the voice of the tempter. He is very familiar with it. He experienced it in the wilderness. It is the voice that tries to get you off the track that God has placed before you. It is the voice that tries to just move you just a little bit. It is the voice that tries to get you to question your identity, as it did with Jesus, if you are the son of God. It is a voice that tries to get you to use your time, your talents, your resources for you. If you're hungry, you have the power to turn this stone into bread. It is the voice that tries to convince you that the kingdoms and riches are, are, are all that you need for happiness. And I will show you how to get them the easy way rather than to walk down this road where you will suffer. Jesus knows this voice. And this voice works in our lives too, sometimes with those who are closest to us. As I had mentioned before, when I started this track and I, I started down the road, and I was already questioning within my own head, like, I don't know, I'm a pastor. I don't know if this sounds right for me. And those who were closest to me were like, no, you can't do this. This is, you know, this is wrong. You know, some believe that women shouldn't be in this position. There, were, there was a lot going on. You know, this is how Satan works. I love C.S. Lewis' screw tape letters because it speaks so beautifully into it. Screw tape is this demon, and he's mentoring his um, nephew, Wormwood, and he's telling him, all you have, humans are so easy. All you have to do is move them just a little bit. Convince them that if they meet their needs and, and um, fulfill their whatever it is that will gratify them in the moment, that that's what's going to bring them happiness. That's all you have to do. Just convince them of that, just that, and let them start living out of that, and wow, watch them go down the wrong path really quick. And that's how Satan works. He's the father of lies in our life. And what's more slick than working through people who are closest to us? Now, if you are married and you think your spouse is trying to get you off of doing what God's will, do not say, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> that may not work out well for you, and I do not want to call when someone's sleeping on the couch for a long time. But honestly, we need to be aware and open to the reality of this truth. So who has Jesus become for me? You know, Jesus says, who do you say I am? Because Jesus wants us to really know who Jesus is intimately. And do we? Do we? Do we just come in and go, hey, Jesus, how are you? And then walk on by? How much time are we giving Jesus? This is a relationship. Are we acquaintances? 
Or are we really giving our time and our attention? Do we sit there and really desire and want to know who Jesus fully is? And if so, how are we doing that? Are we crafting our life in a way where we're in the word, where we let it come to life for us in our lives? When I started to do this and started to develop a deep and intimate relationship with Jesus, he became my Lord, which was amazing. Because when I was lording over my own life, it was a bit of a mess. He became my Lord, and then when things happened, when things happened in my life, or jobs were lost, or there were sicknesses, or things happened in the wider world, I was at peace because I knew that there was one who ruled over it all and who was in all things and moving through all things. And the big promise is that God will work all things out for our good in the end. And wow, does that feel good. Wow, did that help my anxiety level go way down. When I drew closer to Jesus, he gave me an identity, an identity different than the one I had heard, that you are white trash, that you're going to be nothing. You're not beautiful. Jesus, let me know how marvelously I was made and how even before I was in my mother's womb, everything about me, my characteristics, my sense of humor, it was made with intentionality. And my talents were a gift. Jesus freed me freed me from having to live out the patterns that I had experienced in childhood, freed me from addictions, freed me from seasons where I felt so low, I was depressed. Jesus frees us from living into the lies that the world feeds us and the people feed us so many times out of their own brokenness so that we can live into who we truly are. And I'm forgiven. I don't have to carry the shame. I don't have to carry the weight of things I have done. And the more beautiful part is that I can also then forgive others. Truly let go and not have to carry that pain or that anger or that resentment with me everywhere I go my whole entire life. And Jesus guides me guides me and I am so grateful for this because in my upbringing, having experienced abuse, having lived in a home with alcoholism, you know, I needed someone to guide me desperately because choices I made weren't good. I watched how Jesus shut doors in front of my face and opened the right ones. How Jesus took different people out of my life and it hurt but then it helped guide me into better places and exactly where I was supposed to be. And he conquered death. I learned there is nothing that we go through. There is nothing that we experience. There is no amount of abandonment or rejection or pain or failure that we cannot resurrect out of. That is the gift with the power of the spirit that is within all of us. Death has been conquered, and I know that even though I lost my brother Chris and I lost my brother Charlie, I know that I am still in communion with them, that we are united in Christ and in that love, and they are intercessing and praying and guiding up from heaven as they are with the very presence of God. And I am unconditionally loved. Every relationship I have can let me down, and they will. Everyone in our lives will let us down at one point or another because we are all so broken and fragile. But there is one that knows everything about me, knows my deepest, darkest secrets, knows the things that I'm too ashamed to even confess, knows the thoughts that I've had that I'm not proud of, and still says, you are my beloved. And I will die for you again and again and again. When you draw into an intimate relationship with Jesus, these are just some of the gifts that you get. And when I step away from this, when I let my life get too busy, I fall away from these truths. And Jesus doesn't want that for any of us. 
Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for being the very word of God made flesh. We thank you for coming here and leaving it all behind to show us what it means to truly live. We thank you for the love that you just pour upon us, for the continue, continual pursuing of us in our lives that even when we run from you, you want to draw us closer and near so that we may truly see how beautifully you've created us to be. We ask you, Lord, to just take all the things that have stopped us from drawing closer to you, all the excuses, all the things that we have carried that we think are so important, move them out of our lives so we may draw closer to you, so we may be guided by you, so we may truly live into who you created us to be and live out those talents and live out those gifts and transform the world until your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.